Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, <clears throat> we welcome you again to, uh, to, to, to this workshop where we are going to, to be sharing on, um, uh, on, on, uh, on research problem and um, uh, objectives formulation. So we, we are going to, we mm hope, -hmm. um, So we, 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 we hope that it is going to be a fruitful session like uh, we, we had last week. So uh, myself uh, and Dr. Mari, we are going to first present to you uh, and then we, 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 we take um, this, uh, this discussion in an interactive manner and see how far we, we can go. So um, I, I would leave Dr. Mary to today to, to break the ice, uh, give his thoughts regarding research problem uh, and uh, share on the, the food for thought. Uh, Dr. Mary, uh, over to you. You can unmute your mic, you are muted. Uh, thanks so much, Dr. Woyo. Thanks everyone for joining us once again for yet another you know, online session where we are going to talk about uh, the research uh, problem or what is also called a problem statement in general terms. So I just want to start with this quote by uh, Gary Dean uh, in 2011, who says the problem statement and research questions are the most important pillars of any research project. So as you are going to see from this talk that we're going to have today, you're going to realize that any research that's with, with its sold starts from actually having a proper problem statement and must also be supported by a very, you know, researchable, but also equally cl clear and solid research questions that can then guide the whole uh, research process. Because without that, it becomes very difficult for you to then demarcate the kind of uh, research that you want to do it also becomes very difficult for you to demarcate which kinds of methods or methodologies are you going to use to get that data. It also becomes very difficult again to then say which kind of methodology, whether it's quantitative or qualitative you are going to use, unless you are able to pin down and uh, speak directly to your problem statement also, and also to come up with very clear researchable uh, research questions. So in a nutshell, I just want to, to talk about that and then I'll leave it to Dr. Woyo to just uh, continue. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mare, for, um, for sharing with us uh, the, the, that food for thoughts and, and, and all that. Um, so um, what we want to, 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 to discuss with you today is, um, is actually the backbone of um, conducting research. Uh, if you want to do research, uh, you need to make sure that uh, you have a solid research uh, research problem, uh, and then the, the idea is to, to 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 understand what it means. So, what is a research problem? Uh, this is a problem uh, that could refer to some difficulty that you have as a researcher uh, that you have identified in a certain context. Uh, it can be a theoretical context. It can be a practical situation. And it requires it requires a solution. It requires um, a, an explanation to, to, to that regard. Uh, so it is that demarcation for a problem within a certain context uh, that involves the who, the what, the where, the when, and the why of a problem. So basically, what we are presenting at the moment is to say that uh, this is something that should be of concern to you. Uh, this is something that should be of concern, uh, emerging from theory, emerging from a practical situation, and, and all that. So a problem is the what uh, of what you want to start, what is your unit of analysis, and it must have a purpose. So when you are doing uh, this kind of research, you need to make sure that you have identified a certain context in a, or in a practical situation 
Uh, and then you have answered the what questions, the where questions, the who questions, and the when question. And you should be very clear regarding what your unit of analysis is and what should be the, the objective of the, the, the research uh, that, you are, that you are carrying or that you are conducting uh, in, in, in this particular regard. So it is very important that we, 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 we get this bit uh, and we understand um, what it means and, and, and all that. Um, and we understand what it means and all that. Uh, so identifying a research problem is actually an important step uh, when conducting research, whether for master's students, uh, for doctoral students, uh, for, 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 for researchers, uh, even academics and all that. So quite important, but a difficult aspect because many of the people don't really understand what a problem is, uh, what is the research problem and, and all that. So in, 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 in this presentation, we are going to try and articulate what a research problem is, how do we formulate one, uh, how do we go about the, 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 the clarification process, uh, the formulation process and, and all that. So it's I think Dr. Wu has just been pushed out, but I think you should be able to come back anytime. Anytime soon. Let me just wait a bit for you. Yeah, I think it's back now. You can go ahead. You are muted. Mm. Sorry, I think my network um, uh, take me outside of the meeting and all that. So my apologies for that. Um, so we were we were talking about um, the aspects of um, of, uh, of of a research problem, what it is, uh, what we need to what we need to do, and 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 all that. So in 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 this regard, we are we are simply saying that uh, it is a difficult process for you to do that. Uh, and when you are doing this, you should be able to formulate a concrete research problem. Uh, you should be able to clarify the process and doing all this is quite time consuming, uh, but you, you need to spend time formulating a research problem. Because if you do that, it, it, it is actually the foundation of the whole research process. And if you don't have uh, a concrete research problem, it is going to be, uh, to be difficult. Uh, I think I have got some unstable internet here. Um, so a clear problem actually enables you to choose uh, the most appropriate research strategy. A clear problem actually enables you to, to, to choose uh, the, the most appropriate methods of data collection, uh, the most appropriate methods of data analysis. So if you can't formulate a proper problem, you will not be in a position to conduct this kind of research your, your instrument could be bad, your objectives could be bad, your method of analysis could be, uh, could be bad. So it's important that we, we take care of this element of research and formulate things that are going to, uh, to work for, for, for us. Uh, I would leave uh, Dr. Mare to, to clarify on how do we write this statement of the problem. Uh, over to you, Dr. Mare. Thank you so much, Dr. Warrior. So as Dr. Oyo was saying, I think the most important thing to understand when we're talking about the statement of the problem is that it's like the foundation of a house. Let's say you've got a house, you want to build a house. The most important thing any builder will tell you is that you must have a proper, a proper foundation. Without a proper foundation, it means the superstructure, whatever is going to come up as a, as, as a superstructure, will not have a solid ground to stand on unless you make sure that you have a proper foundation. So when it comes to foundation build, you know, building, you need to make sure that you invest the right kind of, you know, the right amount of time, but also the right amount of, you know, analysis and research that is required for you to be able to come up with a solid and uh, concrete uh, statement of the problem. So I just want to, to take you through, you know, how to write, you know, a proper 
statement of the problem? What is involved when somebody says, can you write for me a statement of the problem? So essentially, a statement of the problem is made up of three key issues that I'm going to talk about now. The first one, the first sentence of your statement of the problem must always start with the term, the purpose of this study is to, and then you proceed to say whatever the purpose is. So it must always start with the purpose of the study is to, and then you proceed. And then the other thing that is also very key is the issue of the verb that you are going to use soon after soon after the, 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 the purpose of this study. So the verb, we have so many verbs that we use that you must be able to familiarize yourself with. For example, to, I, I'm sorry, say identity, but it's identify. Instead of identity, it's identify. For example, you say the purpose of this study is to identify. You can also say this, the, study, the purpose of this study is to describe. The purpose of this study is to examine. The purpose of this study is to evaluate. The purpose of this study is to, uh, to analyze. The purpose of this study is to document. The purpose of this study is to investigate. Or you can also say the purpose of this study is to determine the cause and effect if you want to look at the cause and effect. But also the other thing that is also important besides these two that I've talked about, the purpose of the study and the verb, the action, uh, that, you are going, the, the action that you are going to undertake is the, the use of the keywords. Any important statement of the problem must also have what, what we call keywords or phrases. So here, when we are talking about keywords or phrases, essentially what we are talking about is we are trying to answer this following question, who is going to be researched? So it's about the variables, who is going to be researched? That's also very important. It must come out clearly in the statement of the problem, who is going to be researched? So we are talking about the variables. It can be groups of people. It could be a company. It could be a country that you want to, to, to study. So it must be very clear in terms of the statement of the problem. What exactly are you going to focus on? Which group of people are you going to focus on? Or again, the other question that you may be able to answer through this is to say, what is going to be researched? So you also need to be very clear in terms of saying, what exactly are you going to, 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 to research as part of your statement of the pro problem? You can, pro, you can go to the next slide, uh, Dr. Woy. I just want to illustrate one or two things. Okay, I, I am going, there you go. Yes, so here is an example. Now Now I'm, I want, to, want us to do an example so that you see what exactly what I was trying to say. I, was, I tried to break it down, but now I want to give you a concrete example in terms of how you can actually write a proper sentence is, you know, in terms of opening up your, your statement of the problem. So for example, let's say we have this, uh, the statement of problem that I've put in here, which says the purpose of this study is to describe and analyze the attitudes of undergraduate students regarding online teaching at NAST and UNAM during the COVID-19 global pandemic. That could be your, your broad statement of the problem. That's the, that's the first sentence that you can write. So I just want us to, to see now the, verb, the verbs you know, that I was talking about and also the keywords that I was talking about so that you see how it, it plays itself out in terms of coming up with a proper statement of the problem. So in terms of the verb, if we can go back to this statement, you can see that I used the verb describe. I also used another verb analyze. So those are two key verbs that are going to, to, to anchor my study. So my study is anchored on the basis that the, one of the key issues that I'm going to focus on is to, to make sure that I try and describe and analyze. So describe and analyze is, those are the two verbs that I'm going to work with in this particular study. But also in terms of keywords, as I have already pointed out in the previous slide, is that attitudes, for example, the term attitudes is also another keyword in terms of what exactly I'm, I'm going to focus on in terms of this particular study. But also undergraduate st students is also another key keyword, although I have, I have, I have, I have not uh, highlighted there, but it's also another keyword. But also online teaching, again, is also another keyword. So in terms of keywords, I have attitudes, I have undergraduate students, but I also have got uh, online teaching. It's keywords that are that are shaping my statement of the problem. So in, in, in actual fact, the three things that I was talking about, so the first one is the purpose of this study is to, that's, that's the first thing that you need to always to think about. And then after that, you need to, to think about the, the verbs, which verbs are you going to use to analyze? Are you going to analyze? Are you going to examine? Are you going to evaluate? Are you going to document? What exactly do you want to do in terms of your study? And then you also need to think about the, uh, you know, the keywords or the phrases that are also going to accompany that uh, particular you know, in intervention that you want to, to undertake. So this is very key. Whenever you are thinking about a problem statement, think about this 
one key sentence that I've just given you there and say, is my study also speaking to these key things? If it is able to speak to these things, then it mm -hmm. becomes easier for you then to be able to start you know, operationalizing this key to describe and analyze, which are very key in terms of understanding how you actually do your research. I, you can go on to the next slide, I think. Okay, let me go there. There we go. Yeah, so um, you, can take it up, you can take it up from there, Dr. Oyo. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mary, uh, for, 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 for that clarification. Uh, so moving on to um, aspects about where do we find research problems and then all that. Uh, you, you can find research problems by keeping up um, current events. So if you are able to keep up to date with current events, uh, especially regard with while news phenomena and all that, you, you're gonna get a research problem. Like for example, there is uh, a lot of Black Lives Matter protest going on at the moment. Uh, that, that can be a research problem to a particular student, to a particular researcher who want to understand uh, and, and, and all that. Uh, and I, I was reading in the morning that uh, Christopher Columbus statues in the United States are being pulled down and all that. So th these are kind of events that are gonna read, uh, lead a researcher into, into, um, into, into a research problem, getting a, an area where they can write uh, something about. So current events are very important. Dr. Admire Mare there just gave you uh, an example of a current event or a topic that has been derived uh, from a current event called COVID-19. Uh, and he is actually linking the event into online teaching and all that. So that becomes an, an, a, a research area that people can uh, can write about, and that become a research problem that people need to uh, to solve and know more about that, get more explanation and all that. Uh, you can also find um, um, research problems from uh, from past studies. Uh, if you were there last week, we also said gaps are identified in the same section. And we are saying we are saying again this week uh, that research problems are also found uh, in, in in suggestions for from past studies uh, to say that past studies would have said we have worked on this and that, but we would encourage future researchers to also look at this and that. That can be a source of um, uh, of uh, research problems. You you can get this from research authorities in your field. Who are your authorities? I think one of the things that matters for masters and doctoral students is to make sure that when you are writing in an area, let's say you are writing in, 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 in branding, you should be able to know who are the leading authors of branding. Uh, you should be able to know who are the leading authors of competitiveness, who are the leading author of wellness, uh, who are the leading author of that particular area. And those people, uh, they can be actually uh, a source of, of uh, of you finding a research problem that you're gonna run uh, run with because they always make suggestions of uh, what we need to write about, what we need to, to research about and, and all that. Uh, you can also get research problems from theories and concepts, uh, especially the theories where there is little empirical research in your area. So if there is a theory and not so much was done about that, that becomes a research problem uh, that needs to be uh, to be explored, investigated, examined, and we come up with whether this particular theory works uh, and all that. In, in last week, someone was highlighting that what works in the global north sometimes doesn't work in the global south. And in the, that, that kind of difference also poses uh, an area where you can do your, your research and, and, and all that. Um, we, we can also do, uh, you can also find a research problem through the testing of important results, through reading more literature, through listening critically to what people around you talk about, uh, listening to current issues about politics, uh, listening to current issues about social aspects, uh, COVID-19, economics, uh, and technology, and, and all that. So if for you to be able to be in, in a position to find research problems everywhere you are, you should be critical of different views that are shared uh, and that are defended by people around you. Uh, researchers, we are not just people who say yes to everything. 
uh, we, we should be in a position to say, oh, okay, I think you have a good point, but I don't think that that is the, the kind of thinking that I was having on this point and, and, and all that. So it's important that we, we, we know where to find uh, research problems and, 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 and that. Then the, when we are doing problem identification, I think some of the aspects were touched by Dr. Murray. Uh, when we are identifying a research problem, there is a difference between what we call um, world views uh, when we are doing research. So there is a world, there is world one view. This is the view where we, we just uh, see problems, real problems, like crime is a real problem. Uh, poverty is a real problem. Um, congestion is a real problem. Uh, uh, COVID-19 is a real problem, but it, it is operating at a level of what we call world one view. You are, it's, it's, it's just a real life problem. And so poverty cannot be a research area unless you pitch it up to a world two view, where we are now talking about meta science and scholarship. So if you just say, I wanted to research about poverty, you don't have a problem. But if you pitch it up and say, I want to find out uh, 30 years from independence, for example, in Namibia, why do we still have people who are poor? That becomes uh, pitched at a level of scholarship. So it's important that you will be in a position to distinguish what you think is a problem. Is it a real life problem or is a research problem? Because the research problems, they should be addressed. Um, they should be addressed and answered by gathering, analyzing information, uh, analyzing data, analyzing and coming up with conclusions. But the real life problems like poverty, they don't need research. We need to solve poverty. We need to just take action and, and, and all that. So be able to identify what you think is your problem. Is it a real life problem or it's, it's, it's something that we can pitch in world two view uh, and say it's a, it's, it's a research problem. So identify, so in your first step, be in a position to identify a broad area. So COVID-19 is so broad. What exactly about COVID-19 are you talking about? Um, uh, artificial intelligence is so broad. Uh, fourth industrial revolution is a broad area. Uh, branding is a, a broad area. Wellness is a broad area. Me media is a broad area. Uh, journalism is a broad area. Uh, fake news is even a broad area. So we must be able to identify in our broad area, is this a research problem or it's a real life problem? So we should be able to distinguish those kind of uh, those kind of stuff. So once you have distinguished the world views, whether it's a research problem or a life problem, you move on to the next step of identifying what is your uh, what is your unit of analysis for the study. So you should be able to distinguish between world one objects and world two objects. So you, you need to find uh, who are who are your respondents in this uh, and the. Uh, how are you going to, to, to go about that in order to solve uh, the problem you would have identified? So you can even start from a life problem, but after having identified a life problem, please pitch it up higher so that it becomes a research problem in its own right. So identify your unit of analysis. Then the third step is now for you to formulate objective statements. So you should be able to select the topic within a sub area then you should be in a position to formulate research objectives that answers the research problem that you are you are talking about. So that becomes very um, very handy and very important for you to uh, to be able to do that. Um, so, like I said earlier, research problems they need to be addressed uh, by you uh, answering, gathering, analyzing information analyzing data and coming up with conclusions. So that's the reason why it is important for researchers to make sure that they are able to distinguish life problems and distinguish it with research problems. Because life problems are not research problems and research problems are not life problems. So research problems are those that needs to be addressed and they require one to gather information, require one to gather data, require one to come up with conclusions and explain 
the data that they have gathered and explain the conclusions and interpret what do these results mean and, and all that. Real life problems, uh, like uh, the examples I've given you, uh, you don't need research uh, for, 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 for all those kind of things. You just need to, to take action, to take decision, uh, to take interventions. Uh, then these other things can 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 stop. So um, I think I need to leave Dr. Mare here to to pitch in and also try to uh, to highlight some issues before we we, we proceed further. Yeah. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Woyo. As you have rightly pointed out, I think it's very important that we understand the difference between research problems and the real life problems. So the, the, the only way you can be able to do that is being able to operationalize whatever happens at, 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 a, at the level of research problems and bring it down to the context where it actually can actually be researched as a real life problem. And uh, you, you can only be able to do that when you are able to, 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 to make sure that whatever you are trying to, to, to do is actually done in bits and pieces rather than just pitching it at a high level. I'll give an example of the, the one that is just talked about, the fourth industrial revolution. The fourth industrial revolution is a huge concept, but as a huge concept, it has so many other sub themes within it. Automation is one of them. There's also you know, so many other issues around use of ro robotics and all that kind of thing. So you must be able to say, what is the problem? Is the problem really around automation? We probably we want to, to look at the impact of you know robotics on you know human you know human resource uh, you know you know human resource practices within within the financial sector, for example. So you need to be able then to break it down to say in real life what does this really mean? Because you know, if you just talk about fourth industrial revolution as it is, it's a huge concept, it's a broad umbrella of so many things. So it becomes very difficult for somebody then to be able to understand exactly what you want to do. So that's why we're saying that once you get a good research problem and you have got a very good uh, research question, it becomes very easy for you to do your research and even to convince people why you are choosing a particular method of uh, that you are using to collect your data and even to analyze your data because it becomes very clear. But if you don't have that, it's like somebody who, is, who, who, who doesn't have a proper plan in terms of saying, you know what, you want to build a house, but you don't have a plan. So the, the most important thing to have is to have that plan. So essentially what we are saying here, we are saying a research problem is like a plan that you use then to be able to say and to determine the quantity of bricks that you want to be able to actually do whatever building that you want to do. So without a good and a solid research problem, it becomes very difficult for you to determine and even to know what is required in terms of your research. Which method are you going to use to collect data? Which method are you going to use to analyze data? It becomes very, very difficult. So it's very important as a researcher to make sure that you have a good plan. And a good plan is always something that is well thought, that is clear, and that can easily be explained in layman's language to anybody who can listen to it. You can proceed, Dr. Wall. Well, sorry. Uh, thank you for, for, for that submission uh, and uh, clarification. So in, in, in other words, um, we, 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 we should be able to distinguish these kind of um, everyday problems and uh, pitch them higher and make them research problems. So we, we need to be, because when we make them research problems, we are now contributing to the board of knowledge. We are contributing to science. Uh, that's, you, that's, why the reason, that's the reason why you find uh, in, 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 in most papers or when you are being supervised, people would always want you to make sure you have a theory, a model that supports the, the, the research that you, are, that you are doing. So when you develop your research problem, we, 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 we think you need to keep this in mind. Uh, you should be able to outline the general context of, uh, of the problem. Uh, what is the general context of the problem? Uh, and the, some of us who come from management science, uh, we, we always want you to first give us the ideal situation. Uh, what is ideal uh, when we are looking at uh, student learning? What is ideal when we are looking at online learning? Uh, what is ideal when we are looking at every variable that you think about, uh, about highlighting? Then you're going to take us from the, the, the ideal situation, give us the current situation where you are now giving us the context uh, of your problem 
And in some instances, we want you to, to, to make a theoretical discussion around it uh, and give us some statistics to justify uh, or probably to, to, to correctly locate uh, the problem that you are talking about. Uh, then you also need to make sure you will be in a position to highlight key theories, uh, key concepts, uh, key ideas that are current in this particular in this particular research and, and, and all that. So if, at master's level and doctoral level, people should be able to, to have at least a theory that they're going to link to the problem that they are researching and, and all that. You, you can't be researching and you, you know nothing about theories. You know nothing about concepts. You know nothing about ideas that are current and, and all that. Uh, and you also need to, to, to be clear in terms of um, what appear to be some of the underlying assumptions of the area that you are working on this research and, and, and all that, and why these issues that you are highlighting is important. Why is it important to science? Why, uh, why would the findings of this particular study be, be of, of importance? Why does it matter? Uh, the, the, the so what issue has to be, uh, has to be clear in this, uh, in this regard and, and all that. And you also need to be very clear in terms of what exactly needs to be, uh, to be solved. And that's the reason why I was saying, if you just end at poverty, uh, you are in, a, in an everyday problem. Uh, but uh, if, you, if you pitch it out and you want to understand probably why, uh, why, why do we still have unequal societies and, and all that, then it becomes clear what needs to be solved is the aspect of a perpetual unequal society. What needs to be solved is the aspect of uh, a continued slavery, especially in a period where everyone thinks they, uh, they are not slaves and, and, and all that. So, so the, these are some of the issues that you need to uh, to keep in mind as you as you create the the problem statement and, and all that. So it's 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 important that you 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 have this understanding uh, so that it helps you to come up with this problem and write this section properly and and all that. Um, some of the components it might be different from discipline to discipline. We have just highlighted uh, the, the the components that are. Um, a little more easier and a little more universal to most of uh, most of the researchers that could be online. Um, so there, there must be an individual, there must be a group which is facing uh, the, this difficulty, which is facing this problem. Remember my step two earlier on where I said you should be in a position to identify what is your unit of analysis. So there must be someone, there must be a group of people there must be a group uh, individuals who are actually facing uh, this problem. So if you can refer to Dr. Mari's example, so it's, it's on, on the COVID-19 problem and learning. So it's, it's referring to students or the, so students that becomes the unit of analysis uh, that this problem is associated to. So if you, if you think you have a problem and you don't have this component, then we advise you to, to rethink about that and rework it and see uh, so that you can improve your, your problem. So it can be a person, it can be an organization, it can be a sector, uh, and, 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 and et cetera, et cetera. So there must be, uh, the unit of analysis must be coming out clearly in your problem statement. Uh, there must be some objectives. Uh, Dr. Mare is going to highlight on the objectives aspects much more clearer to, to us. So there must be some objectives. We don't do research for the sake of doing it. We must be doing research in order to achieve some objectives, uh, in order to answer some questions. Uh, so there must be objectives that needs to be attained, uh, especially those ones he was talking about in terms of you want to identify the causes of poverty. You want to identify uh, the, the, the extent to which online learning is impacting performance. You want to identify the extent to which uh, our societies are unequal. You want to, to identify so many things to identify, so many things to examine, so many things to critique, and so many things to, uh, to compare. So there, must, there should be no doubt, there must, be, there must remain some doubt in the mind of the researcher with regard to the selection of alternatives. So in other words, we are simply saying the research must address the relative efficiency of all the possible alternatives. That is, if the answer is known, then there is no problem. And I have seen many students, when they are writing this section, uh, they will be writing, uh, and at the same time, they, they, they write and, 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 and appear to, to show as if they, 
uh, the, the answers to the problem that they are researching on, they are known. So if you write like this, then uh, I would immediately advise you that I think the solution to these problems are already available and we don't need to look at this problem anymore. Uh, can you look about, can you think about another topic and, and, and all that? So it's important that we, 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 don't, we don't write something uh, that is already known because there is no problem. We need to write something that we don't know about and, and, and all that. So I will leave Dr. Mare to go through the criteria for research objectives, uh, further clarify the next slide that talks about examples of objectives uh, and, okay. and all that. Uh, Dr. Mare, over to you. Thank you, thank you. So as uh, Dr. Wari has also rightly uh, pointed out, I think what is very important when it comes to the criteria in terms of uh, looking at your research objectives, you need to make sure that you ask yourself the following questions. Are they clear and unambiguous? And most of the time, I think I've seen that students often struggle in terms of coming up with clear, easily researchable uh, research objectives. Most of the objectives usually that we tend to see are objectives that are just all over the place, very unambiguous, you know, very ambiguous, very, you know, very, very vague, very broad, without, you know, you know, clearly uh, outlining exactly what exactly you want to look at. So it's very important to ask yourself, is my research objective clear and unambiguous to anybody who is going to read this? Can they be able to make sense of what exactly I want to research about? Can they be able also to, to do the same research even in their own context using this same research objective and still go on and do the same research that I'm doing? Always ask yourself that question. The other question that you also need to ask yourself is that, do they outline the steps required to achieve the overall objective? Because always know that sub-objectives are always are supposed to be subsidiary to the main objective because there's one overarching objective that you would have about the whole research project, but also after that main research objective, you must have some sub-objectives that are going to be derived from that main uh, objective that you have talked about. So you start with the main or overall objective, and then you go to what we call sub-objectives that now try to explain step by step, how are you going to make sure that you you answer the main uh, objective that you were talking about. And the other issue that you also need to ask yourself, are they interconnected? Because at the end of the day, these they should be interconnected. They must be able to speak to each other or they must be able to feed into each other so that you may have a clear and coherent picture in terms of what exactly you are trying to, to look at. And also, you also must also always ask yourself, are they achievable? Because at the end of the day, it must be achievable. Because if you set yourself huge and broad research objectives, ultimately you may spend the, the next four or five years trying to do that research and still cannot you know, answer the objective. So make sure that the objectives are very clear, easily, uh, you, it can easily be achieved, it can also be easily measured. So again, here we are also talking about smart. I don't know if you have heard about the smart concept where we are saying it must be something that is, you know, measure, you know smart in terms of, you know, is it sustainable? Is it measurable? Is it, uh, is, is, it, is it something that is realistic? Is it also something that is time bound? So you must ask them those, those kinds of questions in terms of, uh, am I going to be able to do this in the next five, you know, five weeks if I have to do it in five weeks? So time, 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 time boundedness of that research uh, objective is also very important. Are they, are they intended outcomes evident? You also need to ask yourself whether the intended outcomes are also evident. If they are not, how are you going to make sure that you refine your research objective so that it can be able to, to become researchable and uh, achievable? And also you need to ask yourself, each, each sub, sub problem should be completely rese researchable unit. So as you break down your research objectives, you are making them more researchable. You are also making them you know, become clear in terms of which method are you going to use to achieve that particular objective. Because remember, you may have three or four objectives but some objectives may need probably a qualitative you know, data set or they may actually need a qualitative research methodology, whereas some research uh, objectives that you have probably may need a quantitative. So it, it is very important for you to ask yourself, how am I going to go about making sure that I answer this particular research objective and which methods do I need, which data analysis tools do I need to make sure that I answer and analyze this particular data set. So these are very important, very, very important issues that you need to ask yourself every time when you look at these things. You can go ahead, um, Dr. Oyo.
Okay, so now I, I, I want to go back again to the issue that I was talking about earlier in terms of then how do you come up with uh, with 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 the uh, with the research objectives? Because most of the time we 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 have seen people coming up with all kinds of you know or, you know objectives, but it's very important again here that you pay, always pay attention to the use of verbs. I have already talked about it when I was talking about the research problem. The, you need to ask yourself what type of verb am I going to use to make sure that I. I, I, I analyze whatever I want to, to analyze, or I find out whatever I want to find out. So we are saying all sub objectives must always start with the term to, as I'm going to show in the next, uh, in, the, in, in these examples. So for example, you want to, to find out the attitudes of undergraduate students uh, towards, for example, e-learning or online teaching. So you may start your, your objective by saying, you know, the, this, uh, to, 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 the, the, one of the sub objectives of this study is to determine the attitudes of undergrad, undergraduate students at NAST and, and, and UNAM towards online teaching. That could be a research objective that you are, a sub research objective that you are coming up with. Or you can say to uh, we, the, one of the sub objectives of this particular study is to analyze how, you know, to analyze the various attitudes of male and female students at NAST and UNAM towards e-learning, for example, or you can say to document, you know, the attitudes of, you know, stu undergraduate students at NAST and UNAM towards online teaching. So it, it, it goes on like that, but it has to start always from the, from the term to determine, to analyze, to document, to investigate, to explore, to assess, to critique, to compare and contrast, to identify. There are many terms that you can use, but always make sure that your verbs are always the ones that are, uh, they, are, they, are they, they should be you know, action verbs that that can that allows you to 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 zero in on a particular thing that you want to because these are the these terms that we are calling the verbs here. These are the ones that are going to determine whether you're going to use a quantitative you know methodology, whether you're going also to use a qualitative. It's based on the use of this uh of this verb. So you must always think about it critically before you just say I just want to write to investigate or I just want to say to explore. Think about it exactly. What exactly do you want to achieve through this uh, sub objective? And then you proceed from there. I'm done with this particular slide, uh, Dr. Roy. Yo, you're muted. Uh, sorry. Uh, so, in, in, in some universities, um, like at the University of Namibia, for example, we, we, we only encourage students to use. Uh, either objectives or questions, not both. So um, the, the, the research questions, they tell us what you are trying to accomplish in your study. And that's the same thing also that is um, uh, established through the objectives that you would have highlighted. So what data you are going to collect and how you are going to collect is also reflected by the nature of the research questions or the nature of objectives that you have formulated like what Dr. Mari has, uh, has previously alluded to. So when you are framing these, please frame them in, in, in a way, because all what we are saying is in, me, in a research method or in, in, in research, there is a concept that we call uh, the golden thread. Everything becomes tied uh, to, to each other throughout the document. So even if you look at the title, uh, your, 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 your background of the study, the problem, the objectives, the methodology and all that they they should be speaking to to one another and 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 exact and and and, and 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 etc so uh your, your your formulation of the research questions should have these issues in mind that it is also going to influence your method of data collection it is also going to influence your method of data analysis so it, make sure when you do this it's something that speaks to your title it's something that's going to speak to your methodology uh, and other aspects of research methods remember there's a difference between methodology and research methods uh, mm. so you, you need to to, to 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 get that on point and to get that uh, kind of understanding as you as you proceed with your doctoral uh, or your master's students and these research questions, they should be able to, to deal with the specific issues about your research. So as, as well as the objectives, they should be able to deal with the specific issues about the objectives. And when you do this right, remember this also informs how your, 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 your questionnaire, your interviews is going to be populated and uh, developed and curated. 
uh, they need to be created from the context of the research questions. They need to be formulated from the context of um, uh, the, 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 the research objectives that you would have. So it's important that we come up with good research questions because they're going to deal with the specific issues about your research. Uh, and it also looks at what you are going to focus on when you are collecting data. So the, this, quite, this is quite an important area that informs your methodology, that informs the method of data collection, the methods of case selection, uh, the methods of data analysis, and, and, and all other things. So it's quite important that we get this portion right. And for you to be able to get this portion right, you should be in a position to have formulated a proper research problem. Because in, in that particular problem, now you are asking the questions that should help you to solve the problem you have articulated or to help you solve the problem that we, we were talking about and, and, and all that. So these research, research questions, research objectives, they are quite important because they help you in all those aspects. Uh, and these research problems or research, not problems, but these research questions, uh, they divide the statement of problem by topic, by themes or by issues. And that's also one of the ways of you coming up with uh, the, the objectives and the, the questions. You, you look at your research problem and you try to identify topics or key concepts or key constructs that are stemming out of your research problem. Then you formulate questions around that. Then you formulate research problems around that. And that's the reason why you find in some instances they would ask you to have a main objective uh, that normally derives from your title and all that. And then you try to unpack that main objective what, what, what exactly am I doing this? Uh, to those of you who have done project management, we call that concept uh, a work breakdown structure where you are decomposing uh, the, 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 two, the, the main objective that you have so that you come up with key issues. You come up with specific issues that would help you to solve this particular problem that you would have articulated, problem that you would have uh, identified and, and all that. And it also helps you if you are if it is possible that you'll be in a position to divide the statement of the problem by groups and all that. In in case you are doing a very big research problem uh, or a very big research, so that it helps you to identify if you have got many more than one unit of analysis, you should be able to uh, to do all that and 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 so forth. Um, I, I leave this to to Dr. Mare to 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 talk about that. And then let's okay. see if we can finish quickly so that in the next 30 minutes as we wrap up our online session, we, we, we do some discussion with the, the audience. Okay, thanks. Uh, as I proceed, I think one thing that is very important is also coming out from the talk that uh, Dr. Wei has just given is that uh, research is systematic. It's a step by step. So if you get it wrong one step, um, I'm telling you everything is going to be fault. It's just like building as I said when I started. If you get your foundation incorrectly, there's no way that you are going to think that you are going to correct the imperfections of a foundation when it comes to, to the window level or something like that. It means even the, 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 the roofing itself also is going to be very leaky. It's also not going to be you know, on, on, on the right kind of you know, you know, place where it, sh it should be. So you must always know that research is, 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 is a systematic thing. It's, it's a step-by-step -step kind of a process. So what I just want to, to share with you in terms of the research uh, question formulation process here, which I just want to sum up is that you always start with an overaching question or an overaching objective as we were talking about uh, just now. And the overaching question or objective is always around the why question. Why? Why is this thing happening? Why is it that, you know, probably people are struggling with uh, maybe e-learning, for example? Why is it that people maybe are struggling with something? It's always starts from the, the term why. It's, it's that overaching question that you always have. So the, the why question in pursuit of trying to then deal with that overaching question, you have to then come up with what we call subsidiary questions or what we also call driving questions. So the driving questions now speaks to issues like who, what, where, when. That's when you try and you know and make sure that it becomes clear and clear to anybody else who is not even interested in your research to understand what exactly are you going to be looking at in terms of this particular study that you want to do. But also one thing that is also important is that the same dri the, the driving questions would ultimately lead 
you to understand what kind of conceptual or theoretical framework am I going to use? So it starts at the level of over aching question. It goes to the driving questions. And from there, then you can then start thinking about what kind of a theoretical or conceptual framework is going to likely use. But it's always influenced by the driving questions that you have that are the ones that will influence you to look at a particular theoretical or conceptual framework. Or it can also even be, 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 be informed by the research topic that you have. But again, the research topic is always, is, is always is, you would always try to be able to summarize your research topic in one, one over eight research question to say, what is this study really trying to find out? So if you are able to, to turn your research question, your, your, your topic into a research question, it means then you, are, you can be able then to move from a research question to a research problem and from a research problem to having driving questions. And then is, it, it, it follows again that you also need to be able then to be able to get a theoretical or a conceptual framework that you are going to use. But one thing that you always need to know is that there is always a relationship between questions or research questions in the theoretical framework. You cannot run away from that. And that's why sometimes you may have your conceptual framework and you come with it to your, to your supervisor and then the supervisor tells you, no, 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 this conceptual framework does not fit into that. So always ask yourself, as I ask myself these research questions, what kind of conceptual or theoretical frameworks are likely to feed off this particular research question? So there should be alignment there. If there's misalignment, it means you are, there's something that you are not going, getting it right. And obviously, even the analysis of the whole research project is not going to make sense to you because there's, not, uh, there's no alignment between research questions and conceptual frameworks. So we always urge students to be diligent in terms of knowing the questions that they are dealing with, but also deal, uh, make sure that once you have that research question, then start thinking about what conceptual framework am I likely to be able to use to be able to understand this particular problem that I'm dealing with. You can proceed to the next slide. Okay, so these are some of the research questions. Now I just want to give a few research questions based on that example that I've given you around the, the issue of uh, online teaching. For example, let's say you, 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 you want to do that particular study that I've just given you. Some of the research questions that you can ask yourself and that you can ask could be, what are the attitudes of undergraduate students at NAST and UNAM regarding online teaching? That could be one of your research questions. And two, what is the perception what is, the, what is the perception of undergraduate students towards online teaching in general? It could be also another research question that you can you know, come up with. Another one could be, are there differences between attitudes of undergraduate students at UNAM and uh, at, at NAST and UNAM regarding online teaching? Another one that you can also come up with, are there any similarities between the attitudes of undergraduate students at NAST and UNAM regarding online teaching? And also, you can also even come up with another a research question, which is how do female and uh, how do male and female, how do female and male undergraduate students view online teaching at both universities? That could also be another way of, uh, you know, trying to make sure once you have these kinds of research questions, it becomes easy for you then to think, to say, for example, if you are, for example, interested in what are the attitudes of uh, undergraduate students, for example, in terms of, you know, thinking about your research methods, you may think that maybe since that I'm, I'm doing a lot of, probably you are focusing on you know, maybe at NAST you are focusing at 1,000 undergraduate students. At, at UNAM probably are dealing with again probably 2,000 students. Probably then you may think maybe a questionnaire would be a best way of actually doing and, and doing the, and, and understanding this particular you know research uh, research objective. If you think that no, my sample size is very small. Maybe I'm just dealing with 20 or 10 people or something like that. Then you can think okay. Well, I can actually be able to answer this research objective by probably just doing focus group discussions, for example, or actually doing face-to-face -face interviews with these people so that I can get a sense of how they actually view you know, online teaching. So it depends on the way how then you have framed your, your research questions. And then that also feeds into the research method that you are likely to use, but it also feeds into your research methodology. It also feeds into the data analysis methodology, data analysis method that you are also going to use. So these things are interlinked, closely interlinked. So you must always make sure that it's always a systematic process there there's no way you need you, there's no need for you to jump any step and assume that everything is going to work well any 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 misstep misstep that you take is likely to lead to to, to more problems in terms of the overall research uh, project that you are doing so with that i think we have come to an end in terms of our presentation i think we can open the floor uh for questions you know clarifications uh we we, we are ready for, for for that uh i thank you
Over to you, Dr. Wayne. All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mary, for, 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 for that elaborate uh, clarification. So um, as a way of concluding what we have been talking about, um, re research problems are, address are usually formulated, or we formulate research problems in order to address uh, real life problems uh, in the social world, in the physical world, uh, probably uh, doing research in order to address stress levels, to address unemployment, to address crime, to address violence, especially gender-based violence, to address poverty and, and all that. And when we are talking about the conceptualization of the research problem, we are referring to a process by which someone has identified uh, a problem uh, and is a, a real life problem and is going to be translated into, uh, into a research problem. So I think um, we, we hope uh, what we have said has been uh, beneficial to you. Uh, and if there are any issues, uh, then le let's, 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 let's interact for the next 30 minutes and see how far we, we can help each other in terms, of, in terms of all that. All right, so I have stopped the presentation. Uh, if there are any issues, then we're gonna discuss that and see. Um, You are free to raise your hands or to just uh, take the floor and speak to us. I think no one has questions here today, so it, it looks good. Um, I have a question. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Thelma. Yes, um, I, I have a problem with the like statistics because you were saying that um, I need to support my problem statement, like the, the current issues. But then sometimes I, I don't have uh, the way they are written, the source I can actually like copy. You can just read from the newspaper and the, I, can I use the newspaper to say, okay, there is a problem here. It was in the newspaper or oh, you need uh, like published um, documents as, as, as a source when I put the statistics. Okay, uh, over to you, Dr. Mari. Someone is asking um, that there are no uh, statistics on the, the topic she's reading or she's writing about are not widely available. So most of the stuff is found in newspapers. Like let's say, let's assume she's researching on gender-based violence so the published figures, you find them in the Namibia and maybe in the Herald. Uh, I don't know what are the newspapers in South Africa or maybe the Guardian or something like that. Uh, so can we rely on, on those statistics as, as I write to, in order to articulate uh, the, the, the problem at hand? I would, I would say that the newspaper should just be the first port of call. So it would just give you pointers in terms of where the statistics that they are actually reporting is coming from. Because remember, newspapers are not, are, are not, are not authoritative sources in terms of actually going out into the field and conducting research. They always publish research that has been done by other people. So out of, after reading the, the article, I always ask yourself, where are they getting this report? Or there's somebody, or there's some report that is quoted in there. So if, for example, let's say they, they quote a source and say, according to statistics from the Minister of Gender, for example, just for argument's sake, then it means that if you go to the offices of the Minister of Gender, they are so they are they, there is information around that particular thing. So you need to just use newspapers as the starting point, but it should not be the destination. That's not your destination. That is just an entry point through which you can then say, let me dig deeper and understand where exactly this problem is coming. Because I can tell you that everything that we want to research and write about, somebody somewhere is written about that. It's only that we don't have access to that particular information. But if we do our diligent work and make sure that we do our research uh, accordingly, we are going to make sure that we understand and find out where that statistics is coming from. So you need also to know where the source, for example, you are dealing with poverty. So you need to know, you know, you know, where are the Ministry of, of, of Poverty Eradication, you know, offices in, in, in Vindo, for example, where can I go and get statistics, for example, around maybe inflation? Do I go to the Bank of Namibia? Where do I go exactly if I want? So it's very important even as a student for you to start asking yourself because sources are very key. Your sources will make or break you or your, your study because if you have 
sources that are not coherent, that are also not uh, you know, you know, authoritative, it's likely that you may come up with a fault study. So always make sure that you rely on up-to-date data and make sure that you follow the trail and follow wherever the sources are so that you can be able then to, 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 to do your, your research accordingly. That's what I would say for now. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. So um, at this level, we really don't in, in, in encourage uh, researchers, students at doctoral level and, and all that to, to, to overly rely on, on, on newspapers. Uh, we, we would want you to, to, to dig deeper for, for these figures. Uh, you will always find them. Uh, I, I don't think we might not have them, but it's, it's the approach that Dr. Mario is articulating that probably we might not have thought about. But these figures are always from somewhere uh, which, which, could be more, uh, which could be more authentic, which could be more uh, uh, better than to, to, to really quote uh, what could the Namibian have written about or what the, the, the Republican could have articulated in, in all that. So newspapers, um, let, let's, let's, let's use them a little. Uh, and in as much as I encourage people to stay away from Wikipedia, I also encourage you to stay away from citing a lot of newspapers. Okay, uh, let me see if they, um, I have got um, answers. Let me see if they, I have questions in the chat room. Hello? Yes. yes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, yes, um, maybe, uh, thank you so much for this, uh, one, um, for this great presentation you have done. It is quite insightful and helpful for us who are embarking on uh, this research program. Uh, but uh, back to Dr. Mare mm -hmm. and also to you, Dr. Woyo. Like, uh, there's a situation whereby, say, I'm doing a research on, um, say, post Mugabe Zimbabwe. Then you realize the information or the data which I'm, go which, which I'm supposed to look at, it goes back beyond, uh, beyond the pre Mugabe era. How best can I check on that one? Can you try and clarify exactly what you mean in terms of the, the lot of data is uh, pre-Mugabe? What exactly you mean? The, 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 the contextual information that feeds into what you are yes. doing just back uh, before is... Uh... Yes, yes. Yes, on that one, Dr. Mari, yes. I don't know, my laptop. Okay, so if I, I, if I am to ask to answer you, then I think it's, it's about periodization. You need to be able to, to think about periodization. I think periodization is, periodization is also very important in terms of research. You need to know wh wh when are you going to demarcate this, your starting time and when you are going to end your, your research so that your research can be understood within that period that you have, you have, you have, you have, you have set, you set for yourself. So, for example, if you have said you, 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 you anticipate or you talk about what you call a post Mugabe, it means you assume that there is nothing, uh, you know, about, you know, there's nothing about Mugabe, you know, that is still, you know, clinging on even to the so-called new, dis new dispensation now. So you need to be able to, to, to engage with that, you know, even in your study. To say yes, I'm using this term post Mugabe, but I'm using it in the context that I, because Mugabe has died or because Mugabe has been removed from power, it must be clear. You must operationalize that concept so that it becomes easier for you, for somebody to say, because somebody can actually criticize your research on the basis of that to say yes, Mugabe may be gone, but the system that he, he was the architect of is still in operation. How are you going to then defend yourself? So these are some of the things that you need to be able to think about critically as a researcher to say. How am I going to make sure that I cover my back so that somebody cannot create, find holes in my study? So it's about, yes, you can, you can write about, you can just say, in a nutshell, what I'm also saying is that you can actually write about to say, you cannot understand Mugabe probably from tw tw November 2017, you know, going forward without understanding what was happening before that. So you can then probably have just one paragraph or so where you are just, you know, talking about the historical issues around it and then try to connect to say, why is it that you are interested in the so-called post-Mugabe era, if that is what you are interested in? Then it must be clear to the reader that yes, you understand the history or you understand the dynamics in terms of where, where, where this thing is coming from and where you want to take it. You just have to give the, the, the reader at least the benefit of the doubt that you know your history or you know the contextual background. So it's just a one, one paragraph, two paragraphs kind of thing, and that should be enough. And then you move on quickly to start talking about your, your current era where you want to actually focus on. 
Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes, I Emmanuel. Are you? Dr. Yes, I'm done. Yes, I, yes, I've been answered. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, thank you for that. Um, there is uh, a, 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 a question uh, sent here to me, and um, I'm, I'm going to read it. Maybe the panelists can can help me uh, look at it. Um, what if one needs to design a research, e.g. designing a heating and cooling system for an organization? Um, what are some of the research questions, or is it research after all? Maybe it's uh, a real life problem which needs uh, which needs action, and then all that. Uh, I don't know if you have uh, if you 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 got that, uh, but uh, what the person is asking is, uh, he, she wants to 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 design research, and she wants to 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 design. Probably this is an applied research where she wants to design a heating and cooling system for an organization. What are some of the research questions, or is it research uh, after all and all that? Um, or maybe it's a real life problem um, and, and, and so forth. So probably if um, it, it also depends with how you would have uh, pitched up the, the problem and all that. But from what I'm picking up here, it, it sounds more of uh, a real life problem. Uh, and it doesn't really translate much into, into a research problem. Because what you are doing here is what should you have been informed by research so that towards the end, we come up with a heating and cooling system that we are going to use to solve uh, a particular life, uh, li real life problem. So I'm not so sure probably if she would have said more about the context of this, uh, we could have been in a position to give uh, much, uh, much more insight to that. I don't know whether Dr. Mari, if you have picked it up, you might also need to, to say one or two. Dr. Matsilele, you are welcome. Uh, you can also uh, intervene and, and, and make suggestions to that. Unfortunately, the person is not around, so it becomes very really difficult for us then to, to interrogate exactly what she's trying to do. It seems as if it's pretty much you know, some kind of action research where you have a real life problem that you want to deal with and therefore you want to diagnose that problem in terms of you know, water, water, water heating or is it the cooling system that she, he or she wants to come up with. So in, in, that, in, that, in that regard, it becomes very really difficult for us then to be able to know where exactly is this coming from? Is it something that you know, she's interested in because she wants to actually offer a solution uh, in that particular organization or what exactly? It becomes very really difficult, but I hope to the next time we are on this set, uh, the person who has thrown in that particular question will be around so that we can deal with it uh, on its merits. All right, uh, then the next one is, can you please explain uh, once more on how to link the research objectives to the theoretical or conceptual framework, uh, then the research methodology? Um, le let me explain the link between uh, objectives and methodology. Uh, then Dr. Mari will explain the link between objectives uh, and theoretical or a research uh, or a conceptual framework. Uh, all we are saying is, um, I, I think this is Anneli, I don't know whether she's still online, uh, but all we are saying is when, when you are formulating your, your, your research, um, research problem and, and all that, you see in a research process, research problem, it leads to research design, it leads to research methodology and it leads to conclusions. And that kind of process, it's called, um, um, the word is running away from my head, it's called a golden thread. So it's your research problem statement should inform your design, should, then your design should inform your methodology, then your methodology should inform the conclusions and all that. So there's that kind of linkages that exists in, in research. So when you are formulating your research objectives, the moment you come up with a research objective that you want to analyze, let's say the relationship between one variable and the next, already you have informed yourself that your methodology is taking a quantitative route because there is no way you are going to analyze the relationship between one variable and the next one in, in a qualitative format. So in that particular way, you would have formulated an objective 
that would then need to be addressed by a quantitative design and quantitative methods. So when, when you are formulating your objectives, the words that you use there also have got an implication on the design that you are going to choose, also have got an implication on the methodology, the methods of data analysis and all that that you want to, 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 to measure and, and all that. So if you want to do that, then it means, so the moment in, in, in a research objective, I will find my student have, uh, he or she wants to, to analyze uh, the relationship between inflation uh, and, uh, and economic growth. Then if you write a qualitative methodology, I would tell you that there is no linkage. This research doesn't have any footing. So th that's the link you're gonna have. So the way you formulate your objectives informs your research design, informs your research methodology, and it also informs the, 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 the conclusions and all that. So we call that process a golden thread, and that's the link. Uh, over to you, Dr. Mary. Uh, I will come to you, Benji, after this. Okay, thanks. Uh, so essentially, as you rightly pointed out, I think it's very important to understand that your research objectives ultimately feed into your theoretical framework. Because there is no way that you can analyze, you know, variables or concepts that are anchored within your research without having some analytical, you know, you know, two toolkits that you are going to use to be able to to make sense of whatever you want to 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 do. So that's why we're saying when we're talking about uh, coming up with the research objective, we're saying it's very important to come up with a research objective that is very smart, you know something that's measurable, something that is achievable, and something that you can actually you know, go out there and realistic too, so that you can also be able to measure it. Otherwise, if you don't do that, it becomes very difficult for you then to actually do the research. And that's why I was saying that after that, you then need to make sure that from your research objectives, you then come up with a proper theoretical framework or conceptual framework that you are going to use to analyze whatever variables are in, uh, at the center of your research, uh, you know, research project. So these are this is very important, especially at masters and PhD level, where people are expected to be have demonstrated a clear grasp of the conceptual, you know, conceptual framework and also the theoretical framework that informs their studies. Otherwise, how are you going to analyze your data if you don't have the conceptual framework or if you don't have a theoretical framework? How are you going to make sense of your data? Because if if you just come up with the data set at the end of the day that cannot be explained or cannot be analyzed through a set of you know, analytical you know, uh, tool toolkits, it becomes very difficult for people to make sense of whatever you're doing. And remember, it's, it's not just about coming up with, 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 with the data for the sake of doing data, but it's also about explaining social phenomena using existing or even new analytical or conceptual framework. So it's very important uh, ultimately that you always ask yourself whenever you are designing your research questions, what is likely to be, you know, the most appropriate, you know, conceptual framework that I'm going to use? What is likely to be the most conceptual, you know, appropriate theoretical framework that is going to inform whatever I'm going to do? So that at the end of the day, these things speak into each other, they feed off and feed into each other. Otherwise, if it doesn't feed off and feed into each other, it becomes just a whole podge of ideas that you would have just come up with. And it won't make sense to any, to any reader. All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mario, for that. And and um, so you should always know that the kind of objectives you would have formulated, you, you need to have an idea of what kind of theoretical uh, framework or what kind of theory are you going to use. Like, for example, I can give you uh, an, an example of the research work that I uh, that I am currently doing. I think I submitted the major revision yesterday. Uh, it's it's a research where we are where we are measuring whether. Um, uh, word of mouth communication predict uh, re enrollment intentions of higher education students. So, in, when you are looking at re enrollment or repurchase intentions and all that, one of the theories that are going to quickly come into your mind is the theory of planned behavior uh, by Achizen. So, it's, it's, it's from, from that, my objective is to measure that, and I already have a theory about that. So, you should always make sure that when you formulate your objective, you should, they should automatically usher you into thinking what could be the next, what could be the best theory uh, to use in this particular study. So that's gonna lead you into, into your theoretical framework and, and all that. Um, Benjamin, uh, you can go ahead. Your hand has been up for a long time. I'm lowering it down so that you can talk. All right. Um, 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Oyo and uh, Dr. Murray for yet another insightful, I think, presentation. Um, my, my question is really linked to the presentation we that you gave um, last last week Friday. So um, I just want to understand the the difference between your research topic, um, your a research gap, and also a research problem. There is a difference between what? Um, the research topic, the research gap, and then the research problem. Or the difference between the research topic, the research um, gap, gap. Uh, and, and the research problem. Y yeah, yes. Oh, OK. Um, so the, 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 the differences between those things, um, le let me try to see. So the, the, the topic, you, it's, it's you, you, it's, it's, you, are, you are just telling the reader that this is the area that I'm working on. So I, I, I don't think there is, I, I don't know, maybe Dr. Mari, if you have got any other idea about that, but it's, it's, it's just a summary of you telling the reader that is, this is what I am, I, I'm working on and, and all that. Then when we look at, at the research gap, uh, at the research gap, you are not necessarily looking at the research problem in itself. We are, we are concerned more in saying, okay, if you are to do this research, uh, what, what, what are the issues are you going to, to contribute to in terms of literature? Because we, we, our concern is for you not to do research that is probably uh, a, a lot more out there. If you remember that car that was hiding in the car park, it's, it's, it's what we want to identify first before we go on to conceptualize more about the, the research problem that you are talking about. So it, it must find a way where we are saying uh, there is this missing link in research and that's the motivation of why I want to do that. Then when you found that particular gap, then this discussion for today is an escalation from that parking that is, that is very empty and the red car is not there, uh, where you are now saying in this research problem that I am doing, I have identified uh, so many real life problems like poverty, distress and all that. So for me to find out having, uh, having convinced your, 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 your supervisors and your, your audience that there is a gap in terms of how poverty has been researched uh, in Africa, in Namibia and all that. So you would now need now to say the research problem becomes a context in which now you are saying I need to undertake a more comprehensive research in order to understand this phenomena. And as I understand this phenomena called poverty, I'll be able to contribute to A, B, C, D gaps. So in, 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 a, more, uh, uh, in a more simpler aspect, though the, the, there is a difference between a gap uh, and a research problem, because the research problem needs to be filled. And as you, in the research problem needs to be solved. And as you solve that research problem, you are perhaps contributing to one or more literature gaps that you would have identified. So the gap in itself is not a problem, but the problem has to be identified. And in other words, the problem has to be real. It, you, you need to prove that there is a problem. And there is also need for you to prove that there is a gap. So in, in, in other words, I, I think that is the explanation that I would give uh, for now. And I will leave Dr. Mare to, to, to articulate further if, uh, if we, and, and also correct if I have not made it properly uh, as a proper submission to you. Dr. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Dr. Thanks, Dr. Uh, so essentially when we talk about the research topic, for example, let's just give for argument's sake, you know, the impact of COVID-19 on, you know, working practices of, you know, of, of lecturers in Namibia. That, that could be your topic. That's, that's the broad topic that you have. But then the gap comes in when you say, after doing your research, you know, your literature search, your theoretical, whatever, contextual you know, you know, uh, you know, analysis, you have realized that there is no one who has written on that particular thing, or there is a gap in terms of that, because no one has actually done anything around that particular, that becomes your gap. But that is not your problem. Your problem then is about understanding what, what is the impact? So the impact, the, the impact, if, the, if for example, let's say there's been some literature that has been published or flared to say already there's an impact in terms of lecturers probably not being able to come to, 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 to teach from their homes because they don't have access to technology. You know, maybe another could be have been that they, 
in lecturers now because of you know parenting extra you know extra duties related to parenting from home or you know parenting while it's at, at home they can no longer do their duties they, they used to do all this could be some of the problems that so you need to unpack to unpack this you know this impact that you are talking about to then come up to a point where you can then say the problem is coming out in the context of saying this is causing this or maybe homeworking by lecturers is making it very difficult for them probably to 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 do a b c d and therefore that is hampering probably productivity or is actually leading to low levels of performance by students or something like that that could be then become your problem so your problem your problem statement your, your research gap and your topic are, are, are somehow different, but they fit into each other. So it's, it's, it's systematic, as we have pointed out. It always starts from the topic. You get your gap. You get your you get your your, your, your statement of the problem, and then you get you then start you know thinking about your research methodology, your research design. You start thinking about the data collection tools, your data analysis, and other issues that are connected. So it's 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 it's, it's a it's a phased approach where you start with one stage number one, stage number two, stage number three. That's why we're saying you don't need to jump to jump jump the gun and just rush into things without understanding how does one step one lead to step two and how is step one connected to step uh, to step two that's very important you always to always need to ask yourself th th those questions uh thank you dr mary for for that uh i i hope benjamin you have been helped yeah um the, the explanations were were really clear all right thank you uh, thank so you so much it, Esther here is asking, how does one strengthen a research problem? Um, my, my quick suggestion to you, Esther, there is uh, when you are writing your research problem, if you want to make it strong, uh, you, you must really prove to me that the problem exists. Uh, and that's the reason why I, I was saying, if you are doing a phenomena, like to say you still think poverty is a problem, I, I need poverty statistics. I, I need you to give me a theoretical discussion of what uh, researchers have done and then so forth and the interventions that have been done and still we still have poverty and all that. So one of the best way of improving uh, or making your, your research problem very strong is you need to make sure it's, 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 you can prove that it is real. And this is your responsibility as, as a postgraduate student to prove that the problem exists and everyone who can read that will understand that the problem really exists. And secondly, you can improve it by in, in strengthen it by putting a theoretical discussion site sources uh, of literature that supports all that and so that it leads towards you uh, going to that particular gap that Benjamin has argued for, so that this research can be supported and this research can be uh, can be agreed that it's a research that is worthwhile and we still need to, to solve all that. So in, 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 if you can give me an ideal situation, if you can give me a, a, a current situation that you can support with figures, statistics, uh, and the other sources to, to support that particular problem and you are able to engage literature, which is more recent, uh, I, I would welcome that as a strong research problem. Uh, Dr. Mary, if you have got any, any, any submission on that, you can quickly come in, or maybe I can read the other question, then you can address them at once. The other one is, what is the difference between theoretical framework and uh, the review of literature? Uh, what is the difference between theoretical framework? I thought you were going to ask, what is the difference between conceptual framework and theoretical framework? Because those two frameworks are not the same. Anyway, uh, we will answer the question that you, would have, uh, that you have asked. Uh, over to you, Dr. Mary. Okay, thanks. I'll start with this last question. So when you talk about literature review, we are saying you are looking at a review of existing studies that have been done around your particular area. For example, we're talking about COVID. So if you are doing impact of COVID on probably, you know, homeworking or e-learning or e-teaching by, 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 by lecturers or something, you need to look at all the studies that have been done either here in Africa, here in Namibia, or even outside of, uh, of, of Africa by scholars from different, uh, from, different, from different universities to see what is it that has been written in relation to what you are planning to study. So that's pretty much what we call a literature review. It's a broad scanning of the environment in terms of what, is, what exists, what doesn't exist, what, where are the gaps. So in, in, as we were saying last time, as you read your literature, that's when you identify gaps to say, OK, there is this issue, but it, it seems as if it's only been written about in America, or it's been written about in Europe, but 
that this is a problem here in Africa, but no one has written about. So that's essentially why you do a literature review, is to understand what is the state of affairs in terms of that particular discipline or that particular area that you are looking at. But when we are talking about a theoretical framework, a theoretical framework is like a mirror that you use. A mirror that you use to, under, to analyze your data is a mirror or it's, a, it's, a, it's like a tool, a toolkit. For example, you want to you want to know whether down and, and underground there there is probably some there's probably there's, there's diamond or something. Now the, the there's machine that they use to say how do you scan to see whether if we want to 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 to, to do mining around diamond here we can actually look for diamond and find it. They are machines. So that's a machine that they use to 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 do a microscopic analysis from 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 the top here and going to see what actually happens underground maybe 30 kilometers 30 kilometers or 40 kilometers down is that is the same the same instrument is what we call a theoretical a conceptual framework it allows you to look at the data using certain analytical you know tools that you cannot do without 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 the analytical tool for example let me just give you an example for example the theory of um, that I was talking about last last week around Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So, for example, let's say you want to to understand motivation. You know the different how, how what what motivates different you know different types of workers at, 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 at an organization. So, as, as as you are doing that particular research already, if you know theories of motivation, you would already be thinking about oh maybe if I can use uh, my Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Then it could be an analytical tool that is going to help you to understand what motivates people to do certain things at work compared to others. So you that 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 concept of of hierarchy of needs becomes a conceptual framework because it allows you to be to understand different types of motivations of different people. So, for example, some people may be motivated by just issues are you know issues around you know social needs. Some it's self actualization. Maybe some it's safety you know needs and all that kind of thing. So a conceptual framework allows you to analyze your data set without imposing your own world view in terms of how things actually operate in the real world. That's what a conceptual framework must be able to do, or a theoretical framework must be able to do for you. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Mari, for 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 that uh, submission. Uh, so, in in other words, um, when you are looking at the, the 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 theoretical framework, it's 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 where we are simply saying that your your study should at least be based on uh, on a theory, uh, on existing theory or existing theories. For example, the theory of motivation he was talking about. Then the conceptual framework, on the other hand, is actually something that you can develop yourself uh, based on the theory and, and all that. So it's, it's actually a graphical representation of you taking your whole study and putting it there on paper. How will it look like? That becomes your conceptual, uh, your conceptual theory and all that. Uh, then I think this is our last question. Um, in addition to Esther's question, can you also please touch on the conceptual framework as well? I think uh, we have we have uh, we have already answered that, Benjamin, uh, and uh, and all that. So um, I, I think uh, we had scheduled to do this for one and a half hours, uh, and we have gone past um, 17, 30 hours by four minutes. Uh, so we we hope that um, this session was beneficial to you, um, and it is going to help you improve your writing, improve your um, uh, your, 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 your conceptualization of the problem, formulation of the objectives, and see you start thinking about the, the theoretical framework uh, of, your, of your, your study. You start thinking about which theory can you link to, to your study uh, so that your study would have more, uh, a more stronger foundation and all that. So um, I, I would leave Dr. Mare to give us some concluding remarks, then we, we will uh, end the meeting. Okay, thanks, Dr. Oyo. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming uh, on board once again. I think this has become now a regular occurrence that we always converge on Friday at four, between four and four and 5.30. So I, I, I'm, I'm certain that certainly next time, uh, next week again on Friday, we will probably be here again. And I think going forward next week, I think what I'm thinking already is that we are probably going now to get into the research methodology, the research design kind of issues. Because now we've been trying to, to just give you the building blocks in terms of how do you do that. But now I think going forward, I think we need to, to start, you know, I know that Dr. Wo is a very is an expert in quantitative, I'm an expert in qualitative. So we are going to bring our our different uh, you know, 
you know, different uh, research methodology, you know, competencies to be here next week when we talk about, you know, how do you come up with the research design? How do you come up with an appropriate research methodology? What, 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 what informs that? How do you then go about doing the actual, the mechanics of actually doing the research using this, uh, you know, methodology? So essentially, that's what we'll be trying to, to look at uh, next week on Friday. So I, I hope uh, everyone will be able to join us uh, on that one, and certainly it's going to be an interesting uh, conversation once again. I thank you. All right, thank you everyone. Thank you, Dr. Matsilele and all the participants and the audience. Uh, until we meet again, it's bye-bye for now. <laughs>